course, I mean, the Wednesday before Christmas, I have to, want to look at the birth of Jesus. So we're really not going to go through the Old Testament like normal this evening. We're going to we're going to look at something a little bit different, um, but it's, a, it's still a, less, a lesser part of the story, not the main account. The main account is from the Gospel of Luke, and we're going we're gonna, to, on Christmas Eve, we're going to have readings through the Gospel of Luke. Uh, Christmas Eve service is, has, over the last like five years, been one of my absolute favorite services where we just, we just sing a couple of songs and, and then read a section of the Christmas story and then sing a couple more. And it's just like such a worshipful night. And so to me, I'm just, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm excited for it, even though Caleb, the main worship leader, is sick. He, he called me today and he sounded like, oh boy, chicken soup, all the good stuff, vitamins, take a nap because he sounded so rough. So anyways, we got to keep praying for Caleb. So he's not going to be here. But it's still going to be, I'm excited. I get to do some more music, so that's a blessing for me. I like doing that. Um, so anyways, we're going to be looking at the Gospel of Luke, um, Christmas Eve service. But this, this evening, we're going to look at the Gospel of Matthew's account. So if you want to, get your Bible out. We're still going to look at the Bible. Turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2. Um, and as we go through a, a part of this uh, this history I, I mean we call it the story but but it's the historical account of the messiah being born and as we as we go through this um section uh it's really what what matthew does really complements the gospel of luke the gospel of luke is a lot more detailed account of the actual event of the nativity the actual birth and um and matthew does it a little bit different and i kind of wanted to highlight and bring out the aspect of worship um, this evening, worship of Jesus. So, and, and again, to me, Christmas is a time uh, all about worship, about remembering Jesus coming, being born, and all that we have in this life, especially spiritually, because of him, the, the, the peace, the joy, all the stuff. We looked at peace on Sunday. Um, so, Really, there is, there's an individual, well, okay, there's, there's a group that we're going to look at, um, and we're going to look at their worship, we're going to look at their heart of worship, but there's really three groups of people in the text that we're going to look at tonight. Actually, there's one individual and then two groups of people in the text that we're going to look at tonight. Um, and they have three different responses to the same thing going on, to the same king coming. So we're going to get to look at some wrong responses, and then we're going to look at a proper response to worshiping the king of kings and what that should look like. So Matthew chapter 2, starting in verse 1, and it says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, Wise men came from the east, or wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born, king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. So we get a, a little bit here, um, but really it's an abrupt burst into the scene after Jesus was born. There in verse 1, Matthew says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem. So, we really don't get too much information of the actual birth. The previous chapter, in chapter 1, the second half, there's a, there's a little bit of information, but there's no mention of a lot of the main events, like the, the census from Caesar, right, where Joseph and Mary had to go to Bethlehem because that's where he was born, and they were counting the people in Israel, the Roman government was, and so it forced them to go to Bethlehem in order to fulfill the prophecy of Jesus being born in Bethlehem, but that's not mentioned in this gospel. Um, uh, <clears throat> there's no mention of there being no room in any of the inns in this gospel. There's no mention of the baby being born wrapped in swaddling clothes uh, and, and laid into a manger. There's no mention of the, the greater scene of the angels and the shepherds. If you guys remember that stuff, we're going to get to look at that again on Christmas Eve. Really, it's just a real brief summary at the end of last chapter. And the summary is really, it's the angel that visits Joseph, which when you kind of put them all together, 
The, Mary gets one visit from an angel. Joseph gets three. And it's kind of a rightful thing, right? Because Mary is pregnant, not by him. And so the angel has to come to clear this up and say, hey, it's a God thing. Stay with her. Don't leave her. Because he was planning on leaving her like in a quiet way, kind of like respectfully stepping out of the marriage. But the angel came and said, no, uh, this is a thing of God. Don't leave her with this pregnancy because it's not from you. It's from God. Um, and then we, we saw after that, which is, again, that's mainly the whole thing from chapter 1, then is his birth and his being named Jesus. And that's it. It doesn't go into any of it. It doesn't say, and the donkeys were there, and the oxen were there. It just says, and he was born. Now, we're not exactly sure, though, how long they've been in Bethlehem. It's an interesting one. All we know is that they're still there, but we're going to see from a couple of indicators in the text from the Gospel of Matthew that it's, this is not the time of his birth. It's later. It's sometime after his birth. Um, but we do have right here in verse 1 an historical marker of what the timeline was. So this, I don't know if you're kind of getting the drift here, but this is definitely still a Bible study. We're, we're looking at the historical account and we're just going to kind of dig through a little bit, and then we're going to look at worship. So it was during these days, it was during the days of, and it's mentioned there, the marker is of King Herod. This was King Herod the Great. So King Herod the Great, oh, I went too, too soon to this, but I'll show you here in just a second what this is about. But King Herod the Great was a historical figure. He was there. And I don't want to go too far into Herod's life. I, I did that before when we were teaching through the gospel of Matthew, but I did wanted to mention a few things. Okay, the guy was really paranoid, especially when it came to people that he felt were a threat to his throne. And that's kind of an important note. We're going to see a little bit later on. Well, we're not going to get that far, but we will see. I'm going to mention it here in just a minute. Um, he claimed to be Jewish, but he was really not a, a direct Jewish descendant. And the Jews definitely didn't claim him. Uh, and I'll tell you why here in just a second. But he killed a lot of people, a whole lot of people, a whole lot of Jewish people. But the, the ones that were more peculiar specifically were his family members that posed a threat to him being the king. He ended up killing like three of his sons. He killed his favorite wife and another wife because he felt like they were creeping in on taking the kingdom from him. So he, we, he's paranoid. We also know he was very small. He was like five foot four. So he kind of looked like, I don't know if you're familiar with Lord Farquaad. I just love Lord Farquaad. I love that scene where he get, he's on the horse and he's got the long leg things and then he jumps off and he's a little teeny guy. But anyway, that's, that's really fun. So this is kind of what Herod's like. Um, and, and so you think to yourself, why is he called great? I don't understand. He's just kind of a mess and paranoid and he's killing everybody. In fact, the, 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 the government in Rome said it was safer to be Caesar's pig than his relative. And that was because he claimed to be Jewish, so he didn't eat pork. So his pigs were safe, but his family would be killed. He was called Herod the Great because, mainly because of these, um, these building structures, these amazing things that he built. These were great accomplishments in history. Uh, in the bottom right-hand corner is the model of the temple. And Herod is, I mean, it was known as one of the wonders of that world, the modern world at that time, was that he rebuilt Ezra's temple when they came out of captivity in Babylon, and they rebuilt the temple. And if you guys remember the whole scene, all the people that were old that had seen Solomon's temple were crying, going, this is a disgrace, it's horrible, I can't believe it. All the young people were going, we're getting our land back, praise God. So we had this weird scene. Well, Herod did an upgrade remodel that was amazing on this temple. And in fact, he was still building it uh, early in Jesus' life. Um, and it was only like, it only stood for, I think, I want to say 30 years, something like that. Maybe it was less, before it got completely destroyed and burned to the ground. Anyways, that was the fulfillment of a different prophecy. But he also built, so let's see, the, the one by the seashore is called the Caesarea, and it was a, like a military retreat by the seashore, a fortress that he built that's the top right. Um, 
The bottom left is Masada, which was another fortress that he built on this plateau that he could look out over the Dead Sea Valley, sort of, and take a stand there against enemies. And then the one on the top right was called the Herodias, and it was just another fortress on the top of a hill. And those are all the ruins of what this man did. It was great, absolutely amazing stuff. But still, he's got a whole lot of problems. All that to say, this is the king during the historical time during the record of the birth of Jesus. And we know that this is kind of toward the end of Herod's reign because after Herodias um, puts a hit out on Jesus, which he's going to do uh, toward the, the middle end of this chapter, he puts a hit out to kill. It's crazy, right? He's He's threatened and scared of a baby, so he wants to kill the baby. So he, it's just an interesting thing. And of course, Jesus isn't quite a baby. He's probably older than that. We're going to see that here in just a moment. But Herod put this hit out on Jesus' life. And then, if you guys remember the historical record, Jesus, Mary, Joseph, and Jesus, they go to Egypt. They stay in Egypt until Herod dies. Then they come back to Nazareth, where Jesus is raised as, a, as an older child, but still a child, right? So we, we see this whole thing, and I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking in my mind, like, older child, seven, eight, nine, somewhere, I don't know, might have been way younger than that, could have been four or five, but we know that he came back after Herod died, okay? All that to say, this is toward the end of Herod's life. So we have this marker, this is the scene, this is the time um, that Jesus is, is born. And then there in the in, in verse 1, uh, the second half of verse 1, we have this other thing that happens. Wise men from the east come to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born the king of the Jews? For we have seen, notice there, whose star is it? Not the star, we've seen his star. We've seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. So the next group that we have introduced versus Herod, second is this group of wise men from the east. This is where they're from. They're from the east. And, and from what we gather, they saw this star, not in the east, but from the east, where they were from, in the west, because they're coming west out uh, to Israel, to Jerusalem, ultimately, to try to find Jesus. And that's what they've done. They've come to find, and it says there, to worship Jesus. So we got this interesting group. Now, most of the scholars believe that they were from the east. They were probably from either Persia or Babylon, which is the reason, if you guys remember, I'm, I'm sorry, the region that Israel was taken captive um, when toward the end of their, basically the end of Kings and Chronicles, when they got taken into captivity because of their rebellion. Um, and this captivity uh, they were taken there some 450 to 480 years before this time. Now, in my mind, it's not a stretch at all for us to presume that these guys were probably from Babylon and had been made aware of what's going on, made aware of the prophecy, made aware of the Messiah from a certain individual. Can you guess who it might have been in, in Babylon? Daniel, Daniel absolutely. Daniel. Now, this is a couple of interesting notes here. The word wise men here is in our text is the word magi. And it's the same word that's used twice in the book of Daniel. One of them's in chapter 2, and I forget what the other one is. It's to describe these Chaldeans, these, these people who, if you remember from the text, they were counselors to the king. Uh, and they, they, they were a group of guys that we see many times in the book of Daniel, who were somewhat studied, they were into astrology, they were into mysticism, they were into magic, um, and they were advisors to the king, and we saw also that after a while, the king really didn't trust them. He's like, no, you guys don't talk to me. I want to talk to Daniel. And Daniel, of course, was getting uh, the prophecies or the answers to the dreams of Nebuchadnezzar from the Lord, the revelation of God. So when you think about this, when you think about the truth of the prophecies of the Messiah to come, that this would have been something that could have been passed down. Now, Daniel eventually got promoted to be the leader of the Chaldeans. So he had a whole lot of influence, and especially godly influence, <laughs> over this group of Chaldeans or Magi. So 
I think it's, it, it, it really is, it's not a stretch to say, man, these guys could have learned this stuff straight from Daniel and could have learned these prophecies of the Messiah to be coming. Very solid possibility. A few more things in regards to these magi. The first one is, nowhere does it say there was three of them, and also nowhere does it say they were kings. You guys know the song? We three kings of Orient are, right? It doesn't say that in, in the Bible, um, but we still like the song. We're okay with the song. But the reason that they say three is because, and you guys probably already know this, they brought three gifts, right? They brought three gifts with them, um, uh, but they were probably advisors to the king, and of course, they wouldn't be kings. But they, they, they noticed and are seeking to find, they're in verse 2, Jesus, and it says there, um, he who has been born king of the Jews, which that in itself is an interesting statement. It's not the one who was born who's going to be the king in the future. It's basically they're saying this king that was born, and he's already a king. So it's just an interesting way to, way to put that from these guys. And they're seeking him because they have seen, it said there, not a star, but his star. So I got a picture of, oh, those guys. I got a picture of those guys. I thought that was a cool picture. And they've seen a star, and they've come to pay homage to this king who is a prophesied one. Now, they're probably thinking of, there is a prophecy about a star, and it's from Numbers chapter 24, verse 17. I don't know if you want to jot that down, if you want to look that up at some point. But Numbers chapter 24, 17 is a prophecy of Balaam the prophet. You guys remember Balaam the prophet? Whole other story. I absolutely love the, the account of Balaam the prophet. But what it says there is it says, I see him, listen to this, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, a scepter shall rise out of Israel. And, and co Bible commentaries across the board believe that is a prophecy of Jesus and a prophecy not only of him, but of the star that's going to come to mark him and the scepter, of course, meaning the kingly rule that Jesus would have. So then there in verse 3, it says, back to our text, Matthew chapter 2, verse 3, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. So Herod hears that they're coming to find a king. He's troubled. I think that goes right along with his character, right? What? A, another king? So Herod gets upset. Um, and another reason that he's probably upset, and, and this is just something I wanted to kind of throw out there to mention, is that I don't believe this picture, even though it's cool, I don't believe it's very accurate. I really, and most scholars that are studying this and study the historical uh, Middle Eastern people of this time, they said there, there, there was probably no way that there were three or four or five. This was probably like a, 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 an entourage. This was probably like a crew of people coming out, a royal expedition that the Magi, the, these, these counsel to the king, would have been traveling with people who were taking care of the food, who were taking care of the setting up of the camp, who were taking care of the feeding of the animals, probably camels. Um, that, that's a safe guess. We always see them pictured with camels. So I, I would say it's safe to say between 15, 20, maybe even some people guess 50, if not more, traveling in this caravan. So if you could just imagine that, if you notice there, Jerusalem is troubled too. If you could imagine seeing this foreign expedition just rolling in to Jerusalem and just like, basically it's like a procession, right? It's like a parade down Main Street and they go to the king and they finally get an audience with him trying to figure out where this, this king is to be born. And so if Jerusalem knows a little bit about King Herod, they're probably nervous wondering, what happened, number one, what did they say, and how is Herod going to respond? Like, are we going to battle against the, the kings of the east? What was this whole thing meaning? 
So they, they go to Jerusalem. And I, personally, when I, when I think of them knowing the prophecy, of them having the expectancy, and other historical records, there's two accounts of Roman historical records of uh, the historian stating there in Jerusalem and in Israel, there was a buzz about the cities, about the Messiah coming. I mean, it was like there was an expectancy going on. People were expecting the Messiah to be born, but I don't think it was what the Magi were expecting. I mean, if you knew that a king was going to be born, you would think there would be some kind of poster boards or sign or celebration, and they really roll into not a whole lot happening and people kind of not expecting it, not expecting this king to be born. Nothing happening in honor of a, a newborn king. So when they get there, it's quiet. And so what does Herod do? Well, let's look at verse 4. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And so they said to him, well, in Bethlehem of Judah, for thus it is written by the prophet, but you, Bethlehem, verse 6, there in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people. Which is, this is the prophecy from Micah chapter 5, verse 2. And I want to read Micah 5 too, because it has a little bit more in there. It's an awesome verse. It says, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrath, though you are little among thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. Man, it is a prophecy. The Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem. These guys have the timing right. They see his star. They come to see it. And I still, I look at this and I think, to me, this is absolutely crazy because the priests and the scribes have the right answer. They're going, well, we know where it's going to be, king. It's going to be in Bethlehem. And these guys are coming to see it. And oh, it's just, to me, it blows my mind. I'll get to it in just a minute. But it was a specific of Bethlehem. If you notice there also from the text, it was, specific, it was a specific Bethlehem of a certain region, which was Judah, right? Because there were two Bethlehems. One of them was up in the north by the region of Galilee, which wasn't in Judah. And so the verse is specific to the, to the one, which one it would be, the Bethlehem, which was about six miles south, southeast of Jerusalem. In fact, nowadays it's not six miles outside of Jerusalem. It's a suburb. I mean, it's expanded and it's basically in Jerusalem. So, but it's still there. Bethlehem is still there. So, again, it blows my mind. They get out. This is, this is the equivalent of what just happened. The, the, the Herod calls the chief priests and the scribes. They get out the Bible and they say, here's where it is. That's what's going to happen. They, they basically do a Bible study and show Herod where this is going to happen. And so we get Herod's response in verse 7. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star had appeared. He's trying to get more information on what's going on. Verse 8, and he sent them to Bethlehem, and he said, Go and search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. Just a side note, because we're not going to get that far in the text. Herod doesn't have any desire to worship the Messiah. He wants to find out where he is so he can kill him. So there's no threat to his throne. But this is what he tells the, the wise men or, or the magi here. So I, I don't, this, there's something, kind of a, a silence here that bothers me as well. The, the, these are very lame responses to that Bible study. And, and here we see the three groups. We're going to go into the last one here in just a minute. But the first individual's response is Herod. He hears that the one to come and save Israel, who he considers himself to be an Israeli, right? He hears that this newborn king is coming, and Herod decides the best thing for me to do with the Messiah is kill him. That would be the best thing. Just so you know, eh, wrong answer. Okay, then the next thing is the chief priests and the scribes. 
who I think in my mind, they blow me away the most because they just don't say anything. <laughs> There's no response. They just say, here's what it says in the Bible, and then, I don't know. One of the commentaries said, and then kind of a yawn, and nothing. It's like, this doesn't have anything to do with what I'm doing. This is something different. This is from the Bible or whatever, and so they don't apply it to their life. But you would think, at the very least, you would hear that they tagged along with the Magi to see this king that's prophesied, who these people from hundreds of miles away have made this huge, expensive expedition to come and find the Messiah. Which, that in itself is crazy, because the history and, the, and just the, the, the Jewish nation, the Jewish nation wasn't, it wasn't like they were lauded as the most amazing people. They were kind of despised in the Middle East. They were kind of complainers and... You know, just kind of their own group that thinks they're better than everybody else, but they're really not. I mean, this is kind of the way they were viewed. So one of the commentaries said it would kind of be like, you know, likened to an entourage of Rome going, we're going to find the gypsy king. You know, gypsies were known for like stealing and pillaging and that kind of thing. And anyways, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting thing that these noblemen would come to try to find this prophesied messiah. And, and I look at this, and I think of these, I think of all of the evidence and the proof that's standing right before the people that are supposed to be God's people. And the, th the thought that comes to my mind is for us today, that whatever we're doing in life, don't miss what God is doing. I mean, don't miss it for whatever, for a TV program. <laughs> there used to be a guy that, that came here that go, man, I really want to come to church, but American Idol's on Wednesday night. And, I, and I'm like, oh, well, okay. <laughs> kind of got to pick which one there, but may we be about God and want him in our life more than whatever else is going on. Don't miss Jesus. May we be ready for whatever he's doing. And, 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 and when I say be ready, I mean, you can kind of go both ways with this. Uh, am I talking specifically about the rapture? No, but it applies that we would be ready and waiting for him and for his imminent return. But I'm talking more about any move of the spirit that he wants to do. And then lastly, our third group of people is to look at what the wise men do in verse 9. So when they heard the king, they departed. And behold... The star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. I have more slides on here than I thought I did. So basically, what happens here is a, a, just an absolute miracle from God. Okay, I mean, if he used a, a star, and there's a lot of different theories about the star. In fact, there's a cool one, I think it's on YouTube, called the Star of Bethlehem that you could look up if you wanted to. And it sh it's a, basically a guy that is a science-minded guy. I can't remember if he's a scientist, but there's a program that NASA puts out of the stars. And basically, you can rewind, excuse me, you can rewind the, because the galaxies are laid out like clockwork, you can rewind the universe and you can see that during this time that, that there's like two stars and a planet that line up and make megastar in the, middle, in the Middle East. It would be, have been from the east of Jerusalem. It would have been right over that area, which got them there. So that in itself is an awesome thing. Of course, God orchestrates all that stuff. It's not a big deal for him. But this part is kind of unexplainable because they get to Jerusalem, they turn south, and all of a sudden the star is in a different place over where Bethlehem is, straight south, south of Jerusalem. So the star hangs the left, and they do too, and they start following. But all that to say, this is a miracle of God. And, and as we see here, really, it says there at the end of verse 9, it stood over where the young child was. There's a couple of, of um, Greek scholars, older guys that I read, and one of them said that this idea is that this 
light from this star was actually shining on Jesus' head, and his theory was this is where those pictures of antiquity get the thought of a halo because of this star shining on Jesus. I don't know if that's true. It's just kind of some neat information from a really old guy who's been dead for a long time. So anyways, I like those guys, man. They got a whole nother set of knowledge and study, and I just love being able to, to glean from them. So this miracle happens. The star reappears, and as you can see, they received it with exceedingly great. They were excited. They were like, are you kidding? Yes. And they follow the star six miles out of Jerusalem to Bethlehem, rejoicing. They couldn't believe it. But it was God revealing by way of a miracle exactly who the Messiah was. It was removing God removing all doubt of them coming and finding that Jesus was who Jesus said he was. Let me just say, he still uses stars, and I'm talking about miracles in our life. When people are seeking him, he will allow things to happen in our life to reaffirm that we're finding the truth, that we're finding Jesus, and I'm so thankful. In fact, I'm excited to keep praying for those things to happen. There's a gentleman that's uh, come the last two Sundays, and I talked to him for a little bit after church on Sunday, and he said, you know, I just felt like I needed to go to church, and I turned the corner, and here was the church. And I'm like, that's God. That's the star. That's God still doing what God does. Reaching out to people, drawing them to himself, if you're willing. And I just love these willing guys who come from afar away to see the Savior of the world and to give him honor. And I'm sad that the Jews missed it. His own people missed it. But I'm, I'm, it's one of those things, God never misses it. So he sends these people. And, and what I think of is what a well-placed God wink on these guys' journey of faith. To just go, man, look at that. He just showed us the way. And so they finally arrive. And you could imagine, to me, I go, I, my mind has to go into their sandals and think they pull up. First of all, what is Bethlehem thinking? This is a really small town compared to Jerusalem. And we got an entourage pulling up. I mean, you know there's people peeking out the window blinds, right? What in the world is going on? You know, the guys are jumping off the camel, feeding them and giving water. And there's just a big old scene happening. And they're going, what is going on? And the whole thing is pointing to the Messiah, to the fact that Jesus has come. But if you could put yourself... In the, in the sandals of these wise men, I, again, I almost said three because of, that's what it's depicted. But if you could put yourself in the sandals of these wise men who now get off their camel and they get their gifts ready and they're going in to see the king, they were probably nervous. They were probably going, whoa, we're, we're about to see the one that's been prophesied from 400 years ago from Daniel and we're going to check him out. This is crazy. In verse 11, And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. A couple of notes here. We know this isn't the manger scene because they are now living in a home. They're still in Bethlehem, but they're in a house. Uh, and a lot of people think they, was, they were probably renting some kind of a, a house because they had a place in Nazareth. They just couldn't go there yet. Evidently, there was some reason. There's some scholars that even think they left Bethlehem and came back, and now they're renting a house. We're not sure. But we know that also that Jesus is referred to here not as a baby, but as a young child. So he's referred to a little bit of a different word, estimated, in, in our minds we would guesstimate, between 6 and 18 months old. And there's a couple of reasons for that. The biggest one is all the way forward to verse 16, that Herod makes a decree, and when he makes a decree to kill all the babies that are in Bethlehem, he makes a decree from two years old and under. So, so he wasn't exactly sure. And he's trying to figure it out because he asked 
the Magi when they started seeing the star, when they knew the child was being born. So this is just one of those things where we look at the historical record and put the little pieces together in our minds to figure out what's going on. But he's, a, he's, a, he's not a baby, he's a young child. And again, we have to let this verse play out in our mind as these dignitaries, who especially from you know, the, the window of the people in Bethlehem peeking out, seeing these guys dressed in some nice clothes, totally different than they're used to, as they get out and they get these gifts and they come into the humble little home of Mary and Joseph and they begin to worship Jesus as king. They get down on their knees and they put their faces to the ground. <laughs> these respected um, counselors to the king. They put their faces to the ground and they worship this somewhere around one-year-old kid, which is in itself is a whole other thing. I mean, what did he do? Take his little uh, rattle and pop him on the head? I don't know. I mean, he's a little teeny baby and they're worshiping him as the king and they set their gifts before him. You know, something that really just shoots off in my mind is, can you imagine what this did in the hearts of Mary and Joseph? to watch these men, these royalty, come in and worship the baby who they know that the angels prophesied would be the king of Israel, the savior, the Messiah, and they're watching this. Can you imagine what that did for their faith? To go, wow. Wow, this is absolutely crazy. Which brings another thought to mind, and it's, this is two plus two. You guys probably are already here, but... What an amazing picture that we get of how we should worship Jesus from these men. And the first thought that I have is no matter who you are, no matter if you're royalty or, you know, well, let's compare it to the scene in Luke, the shepherds who were kind of the lowest of the low in that society. No matter where you're at, Jesus is the one we need. He's the king. And they didn't just worship him indeed. They, they got down on their knees. They put their faces in the ground. But they also brought, I mean, they didn't just worship in word or, or just action, but they also brought gifts. They brought an offering. They, they actually gave him a gift practically. Now, there's something kind of interesting about the gifts. Whether they knew it or not, and they probably didn't, the gifts themselves are prophetic. Okay, the first one was gold. And gold symbolizes royalty, a king. So the gift to the king was gold. The second one was frankincense. Frankincense was an incense. It was a spice, and the priests were known for lighting the incense in the holy place. And so it's a picture of the priestly aspect of the Messiah. And the third is myrrh, which was a spice used for embalming so that the body wouldn't smell, which prophesied of the death of the, of the Savior, of the Messiah, that Jesus would die. And again, I just have to put myself in that place and think this probably touched Mary and Joseph in my mind, in, in my mind's eye, and I can't speak for it. We'll have to ask them when we get to heaven. But in my mind's eye, I see tears. I don't see dry eyes in that house. I see people that, that are, are realizing this is so much bigger than me. It's the plan of God into salvation and just can't believe the scene and what's going on. As these men worship Jesus as king. And one of the takeaways we get from this is it affects and impacts people around us when we humbly and practically worship Jesus and they can see it, right? I mean, we have this same sort of potential. Not to be seen worshiping. That's not the thing. I mean, I'm not talking about standing in the front row during worship so you can stand up and wave your arms and praise the Lord to be seen. That's, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is a natural flow of love and worship because of our relationship with Jesus. And when people around us see that, it speaks volumes to who Jesus is. In our life, in our heart, it speaks volumes to them of the reality of God and Jesus, and it's just so important. 
that we would worship Jesus out of a genuine... And now, let me just say this too. Worship isn't just singing, although singing is a part of worship, right? Worship is not just singing. Worship is living before Jesus in a way that is honoring to him and yielding our lives to him, serving him, practically loving him. That's really what worship is. It's not just singing songs. And then we see one last thing. We're just about to wrap it up. We see one last thing in verse 12. We see verse 12 then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod. They departed for their own country another way. So we we see that they were going to come back to Herod, but they were warned in a dream, so they didn't. Now, This brings up another point, another thought in my mind. We're not sure how long the guys stayed there in in Bethlehem and worshipped, but it wasn't, okay, we're done, dropped off the gifts, we're out, because they spent a night, at least one night, because they were shown in a dream, right? So they spent at least one night, but we're not sure. But that leads me to another thought. It seems that these guys didn't want to leave the presence of the king. They just wanted to linger for a little bit. And they didn't just drop the stuff off and take off. They stayed, at least for a night. And when I think about this, it just speaks to my heart. Where are we at? Do we want to spend time? Do we want to linger in the presence of Jesus, in the presence of our King and our Messiah? And, of course, we know who he is more than these Now we're going to, again, like I said, we're going to worship again on Friday evening at, the, at the, the Christmas Eve service. But there's something that I see here for us, for our families. We need to worship him here at church on Friday night. And I'm, I'm talking, my thinking is kind of going towards this season, right? The Christmas season. But we need to worship at home. Our families need to see us. And I would even say, you know, I would even say more to the men. They need to see you lead the house in worship. But you know what? It's, this is to the ladies too. And I, and I had a couple of thoughts here. Um, at the beginning of the New Testament church, you know where the New Testament church primarily met? Houses, homes. They didn't have buildings. They met at home, and they worshipped at home, and the family saw the people worshipping God right there in life, you know? There's there's, there's something that happens when everything becomes, like, religiously churchized. That's a word I just made up. But it's, it's, it's like where, oh, yeah, Bibles, they're for at church. No, Bibles are for at home. Bibles are for everyday life. And worship and prayer isn't just for a church. Our family, those around us, need to see prayer in our life. They need to see worship at home in our life because this is the reality of a life lived as worship or of worship to our great God and King, to Jesus, our great Messiah. And when I I think about the New Testament church meeting at homes, there's a couple of thoughts that stand out to me. One of them was, I don't know if you remember from the book of Acts, there was a woman named Lydia. She was industrious. She was a seller of purple. And she got saved. And as far as we know, there's no husband, there's no Mr. Lydia in the Bible. But there is Lydia, and and it says there in that account that her and her household believed. Lydia was the leader of her household. There wasn't a guy there. And she led the household to Jesus. A word for, for single moms, single dads, whoever it is, that we are that. We're, we're, the, we're the priests, so to speak, of our homes and our families, of our houses. And then, of course, one of the, one of the most awesome accounts of a convert in Acts chapter 10, Cornelius and his awesome uh, b- you know, turning to Jesus and, and the vision to Peter and Peter coming and God telling Peter what I have called clean, you must, not, you must not call unclean. And Peter finally finding out, oh my goodness, he's talking about Gentile people. And the whole, this is the beginning of the Gentile church movement in Acts chapter 10. Cornelius gets saved and guess what? His whole household 
as he leads them to Jesus. It's so important for us to not think church is the place for Bibles, but to have our home honor the Lord, that we would worship him at home. And so we see that happen in Cornelius' life. They get baptized. The household believes. But you know what else? And, and here it is. Here's one of those ironic, amazing, blow-my-mind things. You know, the first people to actually come and worship the Messiah was a group of Gentiles. A group of wise men. I almost said wise guys, but they weren't. They were wise men. And they came and they brought offerings to the king. Not even his own people. Those high priests could kind of care less. But God's plan and his worship, no matter who wants to stop it, it cannot stop. It will not be stopped. And I'm thankful that he used those Gentiles. It's it's an awesome blessing. But our home needs to be a, a, a life in our house needs to be a life lived as a sweet aroma, a sweet offering, live before Jesus, live to Jesus. And I would say, I would even venture to say this, and it's something that I learned in our family, especially on Christmas morning. Man, make it be about Jesus. Not presents, not gifts, not food. Make it be about Jesus, because that's what it's about. Amen? Your children need to see you like we saw these wise men. Seeking Jesus at great cost. Going to great lengths to find Jesus. Number two, bowing our lives in worship to Jesus. Number three, giving practically to Jesus. Again, whether that's money, tithes, offerings, whether it's time and service. Our children need to see us come to a place and gather to worship with a family of believers. Our children also, the fourth thing, need to see us lingering in the presence of Jesus, enjoying the presence of Jesus. That's one of my, I don't know, that's one of my favorite things um, is for me is to just be in a place of maybe having my devotional time or whatever, but I love to I love to just put my hands up when nobody's looking and say, "Praise you, God, for your faithfulness, for your goodness." And I also, I mean, this is part flesh. I think I like to be caught. I like to do that in front of my kids, and them look at me a little extra intently to see if I'm crying and watch a tear come out of my eye because God is so good. And I'm just, man, we need to example that to our family and lingering and enjoying our Savior. Good night. I think if if people think that all you you enjoy of church is just kind of like the donuts, forget it. Jesus and the relationship with him is something to be enjoyed, something to lavish and to hold on to and to long for and to linger in. And the last thing, is that, that they would see us, and it kind of ties in with what I just said, but that people, the world would see us just worshiping in a practical way, living a life in a relationship with Jesus, unashamed because he's worthy. Amen? So I want to ask uh, Pastor Joe to come up, and I don't know if I wanted to just close in one song this evening. Um, I was going to I was going to have it more be a, a more of an evening of worship, but I talk way too much. You guys probably noticed that. But if you would just stand with me and let's just bring our hearts before Jesus, before the King. Amen. And just sing a song of praise because he's so good and because of his great faithfulness. Worthy of every song I could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We want to live for you. Jesus' name. 
Jesus, the name above every other name. Yes, you are. Jesus, the only one that could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we want to live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside. Open up my eyes to wander. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. God, we just praise you tonight, Lord. We worship you. Jesus, we thank you that you came. God, I, and it's our heart's desire to give you our gifts, to lay down our life, to get on our knees before the great and awesome Savior who has saved us, who has ransomed us, who has taken the place of the wrath of God on the sin of man. And, and for those of us who have trusted you, Jesus, you've done it. Lord, you've, you've taken that crimson stain and washed it white as the snow. And Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we thank you. Lord, and it is our desire to worship you in spirit and in truth. God, I pray that you bless your people tonight and lift our hearts and lift our eyes and put them back on that reason for this season and the reason for our life, the reason that we're here, not to fulfill ourselves in some way, but to follow and to serve and to give. So God, we thank you, we praise you. Again, God, help us to be the light in this dark world. Fill us with your light. We ask and we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, Merry Christmas. God bless you.